Sports betting is so popular. It's an industry that could bring tons of people into Bitcoin. DLC is a really good way to bring all that stuff to Bitcoin. DLCs and oracles are really exciting. Uh, I hope that they will replace centralized derivatives. I want to tell you about something, and it's called Discrete Lock Contract, DLC. I was obsessed about it over the last two weeks, and this is the proof. Like, my whole desk is like full of papers. Uh, I installed the wallet on this Ubuntu machine, and I even went to the Vancouver Canucks game to, to just experience it myself. So let me quickly show you what is it about, because I had to experience first, and let me show you that experience. I live in Vancouver, and the last game of the hockey season was coming right when I got interested in DLCs. So I took a bet against this man, Chris Stewart. He is the founder of Shortbeats, a wallet app that allows you to make any kind of bet in a non-custodial way. And obviously being from Vancouver, I put all my spare Bitcoin, about 25,000 Satoshis, on a Vancouver Canucks winning the game. And it was tough. I was there sitting on pins and needles, at some point we were losing 0-2 against the LA Kings, but the goal in overtime did settle the bet on my advantage. I came back home, pasted the Oracle attestation into my wallet and voila, I was 25,000 Satoshi richer. Thanks Chris. We have a lot of smart contract capabilities on top of Bitcoin, like the first NFT implementation through Counterparty, tokens like USDT on Omnilayer, state chains, side chains, Lightning. But I believe that discrete lock contract is a smart contract that unlocks a lot of Bitcoin's potential and will create a ton of utility. Here is Austin Hill, co-founder and first CEO of Blockstream. Someone comes to me with a peer-to-peer -peer sports betting app. Great. Sport results are very easy to have oracles. You can have multiple signed sources. You can have two people agree. You and I can agree that we're betting on the outcome of the Super Bowl, and we're gonna agree that the outcome is decided by Fox News, Yahoo Sports, and ESPN's sports feed. We're gonna take the best results of those three. And, you know, if they all agree on the result, then the winner of our sports bet. Sports betting is so popular. It's, uh, it's an industry that could bring tons of people into Bitcoin. But what is this enigmatic DLC? Even though I've read all the papers and protocol specs, watched every podcast mentioning the word, I wouldn't explain it in more simple terms than Chris did, as he is the person behind Shortbeats, the company and wallet that I've used to settle my bet. I've called him to ask a few questions. Discrete log contracts, as you know, it's kind of a way to do DeFi on Bitcoin. You can do things like sports betting or you can make financial derivatives. The uh, selling point of discrete log contracts is, you know, you don't have to send your money into some exchange to be able to um, access risk management tools or bet on your you know, favorite sporting event. And I agree with the ability to take on any bet, whether it be about sports or about the financial markets. The fact you're able to do this on Bitcoin is a huge advantage. Why you ask? Obviously, any custodial application can seize your funds, cheat you, or at least take significant fees for providing their service. And people are willing to bet against almost everything. It's one of the pillars of efficient markets. But there are markets for some of the wildest things. And the reason that you have these markets is because when two mutually consenting adults have opposite views and they want to express them, then you want to be able to let them do that and allow them to basically either hedge their risks or take on risks that they're able to do. DLCs allow a plethora of different use cases. I've even tried the wallet that allows users to trade CFD options with two times leverage on Bitcoin. Warning, CFD options are essentially gambling on the price prediction and in some countries are outright banned. This wallet is called Ichisats and allows this CFD trading in non-custodial way and in the design fully peer-to-peer -peer way using DLC on the backend. They are bets essentially. And the interesting thing about bets is that many types of financial contracts are essentially bets, even if we don't normally think of them as bets. For example, I opened a long position on Friday, 
closed it on Saturday and earned 1500 satoshis on that deal. I believe that in the future we will have Bitcoin DLC wallets for all sorts of use cases. Gambling, betting, financial market and even professional traders will use them to hedge their risk. But how? It looks ingenious, the idea has been floating around since at least 2017. How is it working to achieve such a big potential? Before I go into more details how the DLC works, let's look at the first paper related to this new functionality. Look at this name, the man behind this idea. This man is Tadeusz Dreja, and this is the paper he co-authored about this new idea we knew as Lightning Network. I hope you've heard about the Lightning Network, if not, you are 4 years too late to the party and you better catch up. The concept of discrete lock contract in its core is very similar to the one of the Lightning Network. In both examples, the first being the bet on Vancouver Canucks game and the second gambling on CFD options through Ichisats, in both of these cases there were only two on-chain transactions. Similar like with the action of opening and closing channels on Lightning Network. The first on-chain transaction logs the fund into 2 of 2 multisig and the second transaction distributes the funds. Because at the end of the day, all the Bitcoin network sees is one funding transaction and one closing transaction. So the Bitcoin network is just completely unaware of all this other off-chain data that our wallets are sharing between each other. We can see it here in the Bitcoin Explorer. First transaction spends funds of both parties into mutual 2 of 2 multi-signature smart contract address. That's the non-custodial part of it. While all the calculation is being made by our wallets, these wallets have to store all the anticipated signatures of all the outcomes that may happen. In the case of the game, there were only limited outcomes. Win, lose, act of God, or it might also be draw. And by pasting Oracle attestation into the wallet, I've created a closing transaction redeeming all locked funds into my wallet since I've won. And this is the smart contract part of it. But how many possibilities are there? Is it limited? There is two different types of contracts with DLCs. So what we did is a, called an enumerated contract where you simply just list the outcomes like, you know, LA Kings winning, the Canucks winning act of God or tie, like you said. And then the other type is numeric contracts. And with numeric contracts, you can have a ton of different outcomes. Like, uh, for instance, um, a common Oracle that we have on our Oracle Explorer is attesting to the Bitcoin price and the range of prices that the Oracle can accurately attest to is from zero to $262,000. So that means there's 262,000 possible outcomes uh, for these DLCs and our wallet software can handle that. While the Canux game bet was enumerated DLC, the CFD contract I've opened was numeric. It was also a pair 2 of 2 hash lock transaction with a single closing transaction. But because the gist of the CFD contract is the closing price, it was numeric. In my opinion, the most interesting property of DLCs is the fact that there are thousands of possible outcomes available, like Chris mentioned. Let's quickly jump on the blockchain other than Bitcoin, which some people claim is the only one that enables smart contracts. One could create a contract visible to everyone on chain, one that would allow a similar use case, like betting, but to execute it would require a lot of data to first be pushed to blockchain and then validated by everyone who runs the node. And that's just for finding a counterparty and for settling data provided by Oracle. But this isn't ideal because it would create a huge overhead for you with high fees and tough validation to churn through for high-end consumer-grade machines. But you don't have to trust me on this one. Here is Dr. Russell O'Connor, an expert on computation theory. When the Sigma-1 perspective, what you think of is that I'm going to write a program and everyone on the blockchain is going to execute this program and it'll do, everyone will do the same thing because they're running it in the same environment. And this sort of would apply to the sort of the proof carrying code idea as well, right? With Delta-0 thinking, right, what you think is that I am going to run the program myself on my computer and I'm going to generate some witness data. 
and I'm going to have everyone only validate that witness data instead of running the entire program. Uh, and that is like, it's, it's a change of attitude and it, I think it will influence how you will design your blockchain languages when you think of your problem this way, rather than distributing the computing and having everyone run your program, have you, the person making the transaction, run the program, produce the witness. If that gave you a headache, what he means is that checking contract validity on chain is fine but pushing everyone to compute it on-chain is just bad engineering. Smart contracts can be executed by the counterparties off-chain, and the witness of the computation can then be published on-chain. For this reason, it doesn't congest the blockchain. That's why Bitcoin DLCs are so lightweight, and probably, most importantly, they are very private too. Theoretically, Oracle should never know which deal it's attesting, because all locked transactions for bets looks exactly the same on-chain. They show up as two of two multi-signatures. This privacy feature is what allows Oracles to not cheat or become malicious actors. But let's address the elephant in the room. Oracles. There always be some risk regarding Oracles to post wrong data because they are fitting the results of real-life events into the digital world by providing attestations. Oracles may be a single person posting some data once in a while, or automated streams of results, for example Bitcoin price, NHL results, or even super detailed statistics about a single game. There are ways of mitigating this risk by spreading the Oracle attestation trust similarly to a multi-signature scheme and pay these oracles for their service. Uh, you probably do want to, you know, maybe pick three oracles and maybe you want to pay all three oracles too. And that keeps you, you know, sleeping soundly at night, knowing that I paid them, they uh, have a reputation behind them. And then I also need, you know, two out of the three to lie for me to lose my money or maybe three out of the five to lie to lose my money. And of course that's still possible. Oracle problem is unsolvable in any other way than building reputation. It can't be solved using computer science as there is a human element to it. Incentivizing and spreading trust are two main ideas on how this issue can be tackled, allowing honest attestations to build their reputation. Ideally, oracles need to be able to provide accurate data to earn rewards and instill trust. When I asked Chris, how these oracles may receive payment, I made a very dumb mistake, thinking it may be possible on-chain in the same lock transaction that the bet between two parties is constructed on. But obviously it would deny the privacy part of these contracts. What your idea is, is like baking it into the DLC transaction itself. So like, you know, there's an output that goes to me, there's an output that goes to you, and then there's an output that goes to the oracle. And that is one way of doing it, but you, as you rightfully point out, um, you know, you are revealing information on the blockchain in that case. You could also pay for the attestation on Lightning or something like that, or maybe you just pay the Oracle up front to have them produce the announcement. Stop, 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 stop. Technology is awesome, but what does it mean for you, a Bitcoin user? First of all, Technologies like DLC create demand for Bitcoin as a network and if DLC would be happening on-chain, it may rise the demand and transaction fees. I want to like actually focus on what are people paying fees for over there, why do they find these things valuable, and am I as a Bitcoiner missing something that's happening in these other ecosystems, and then can I do anything about bringing these features to Bitcoin so that, you know, A, Bitcoin's more useful, and B, um, you know, Bitcoin fee pressure starts going up because we need both, I mean, I think we all want to see both those things happen. Um, you know, what from where I sit in the ecosystem, I guess, you know, I'm, I've been a Bitcoiner through and through for quite some time now, and uh, I think uh, we do a good job of, you know, criticizing other chains, but we don't also, but we kind of tend to miss the valuable feature that's kind of underlying the thing and take it seriously. And I've been, you know, I, I'm guilty of this in the past. I'm, not, I'm no saint in that regard, but I'm trying to change my mindset and uh, um, 
you know, take the yeah, take take the take the arguments more seriously and figure out if there is a way to bring this to uh, the Bitcoin ecosystem. Because you know, I I think it would it would be wonderful to have some of these features. Not for me to judge if that's a good thing, as Bitcoin maximalists are changing their narratives whenever there is a shift. High fees were good in the past because they were indicative of the usefulness of Bitcoin as a network, while now, when Ethereum fees are way higher, high fees are obviously a bad sign. Um, it's it's very interesting to see uh, the, the the shift in narratives from the Bitcoiners over the years of, uh, you know, Bitcoin's going to be a high fee blockchain and it's going to, you know, be moving large amounts of value. And uh, now we've almost flipped in the last like three or four years to Bitcoin to low fee blockchain. And you should come to Bitcoin and do all your, your transactional business over here. And Ethereum now is a high fee blockchain. And, you know, that it goes two ways, right? You know, the Bitcoiners have kind of flipped their um, narrative, but Ethereum people have flipped their narrative too. And, you know, Bitcoiners like to criticize the Ethereum side of things, which is true, um, but don't necessarily look to see as like, oh, hey, like, we got to figure out this fee problem at some point, like maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but we do need, uh, you know, the, the, this demand for transaction fees to sustain the network over a long period of time. But DLC is a technology that can enable a lot of these functionalities already so popular on other altcoin chains. Since DLCs in their core are very simple and consist of two standardized transactions, it's impossible to hack it there are no contract owners to exit SCAMU and it's very private. Just two parties involved are knowledgeable about which transactions belongs to their bet. Now, DeFi can be really decentralized and people are already trying to port this technology to the Lightning Network. Bets can also be more algorithmic and focused on hedging the risk. It means that there is a possibility of creating a stable coin using Bitcoin for example by having real-time stable channels on Lightning Network or stable wallets on-chain. While all this sounds great, both wallets I've used, so Shortbits and Ichisats, haven't yet added peer-to-peer -peer discoverability, which is a crux of this technology. People can't make bets if they are not able to find each other. Shortbits is a step ahead of the other companies in this space their wallet actually allows for making bets with a counterparty compared to Ichisats where my trade was against a market maker run by the wallet provider. Also, the DLC spec, which is a type of rule guide for developers that is being curated by Shortbits, is in very early stages. So we're working with uh, the open source community to build an open standard for a discrete log contracts kind of like there's an open standard for the Lightning Network. The Bitcoin Network has these things called BIPs or Bitcoin Improvement Proposals. Uh, we don't want to have a monopoly over DLCs. Despite being in its infancy stage, my opinion is that this technology is going in a good direction. Hence, I decided to make this video. I am very excited about new possibilities in DLCs and I feel similar when I started experimenting with Lightning Network in 2018. And seeing how far the Lightning Network has come since then, this is surely a good sign. And the hurdles to get into using it are similar to the Lightning Network. I had to set up Umbral node to be able to experiment with these wallets, but Umbral wouldn't sync before the last games of Canucks this season. I had to turn on my old Ubuntu laptop and build the Shortbeats wallet from binaries. If you don't know what binaries are, point for me, it's not easy. If it wasn't for Chris's help, I wouldn't have managed to finish it on time. But it's better to discuss the good and bad sides of that technology, otherwise we may end up with the most popular wallet being a custodial service, like Wallet of Satoshi. To recap, DLC is just a smart contract that can be built on Bitcoin to allow two parties to take on any bet they want. It's fairly simple, non-custodial and private. And if you like this video, please share it around. Also below are two videos that are very good and you will like them as well. So yeah, see you later. Keep doing Bitcoin things. Bye.